Our second lesson this morning comes from the book of Acts, chapter 8, verses 26 through 39. Then an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Get up and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a wilderness road. So he got up and went. Now there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of the Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, in charge of her entire treasury. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning home. Seated in his chariot, he was reading the prophet Isaiah. The spirit said to Philip, go over to this chariot and join it. So Philip ran up to it and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah. He asked, do you understand what you are reading? He replied, how can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to get in and sit beside him. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this, like a sheep he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb silent before its shearer, so he does not open his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, about whom, may I ask you, does the prophet say this, about himself or about someone else? Then Philip began to speak, and starting with this scripture, he proclaimed to him the good news about Jesus. As they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. What is to prevent me from being baptized? He commanded the chariot to stop, and both of them, Philip and the eunuch, went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. The eunuch saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I have never been a great maker of scrapbooks. Every year, I think this is the year I'm going to sort through all those pictures on the computer and put them together artfully to tell the story of our family. And every year, it doesn't happen. The closest I've ever come is that I did make baby books for each of my three children. Pictures and statistics from their birth and all those first year milestones of smiling and rolling over and sitting up. The book of Acts is like a baby book that illustrates the early years of the church. And like a baby book, Acts gives us a glimpse into the triumphs and failures of this growing and changing community of believers. But unlike our baby books, in the book of Acts, there is another main character besides the baby who shows up in just about every story, God in the form of the Holy Spirit. Acts is the book that teaches us the power and importance of the Holy Spirit in the life of the church. In today's story, the Spirit sends Philip to a wilderness road. And in the Bible, the wilderness isn't just a physical description, it's a spiritual one. The wilderness is where transformation happens, and this story is no exception. Once on the road, Philip sees a chariot, the ancient version of a souped-up sports car. When he follows the orders of the Holy Spirit and starts running alongside it, he hears someone inside reading something familiar, a passage from the prophet Isaiah. Now, reading for pleasure was not something a lot of people did in the ancient world. The sacred texts of the Jews were painstakingly copied onto parchment scrolls, which were very expensive. So when Philip hears the rider of the chariot reading from this scroll, he immediately knows this person is wealthy and powerful and educated, and this person knows something about God. Imagine the scene. Philip running alongside a moving chariot, struggling to keep up, panting out the question over the sound of the wheels and the horses, do you understand what you're reading? At this point, what should have happened is that the man inside the chariot should have dismissed Philip as a rude and intrusive stranger, kind of like the person who starts washing your windshield at a stoplight and then wants to be paid for it. 
people didn't come running up alongside fancy chariots and start questioning the people inside. The man should have urged his driver to go faster and leave this unwelcome interruption in the dust. Instead, this wealthy, powerful, well-educated court official asks for Philip's help. He doesn't understand what he's reading, or at least isn't sure he does, so he invites Philip to join him to teach him about this passage of Scripture describing a suffering servant of God. What Philip could not have known when he was running alongside that chariot is that in addition to being wealthy, powerful, and educated, the rider in the chariot was also a eunuch, a castrated male servant classified as a sexual minority. This is why he could work near the queen, because eunuchs were deemed safe to serve women in a royal household. This particular eunuch was literate and had access to the Hebrew scriptures, but in those scriptures, he would have found contradictory messages about whether someone like him, a eunuch and a foreigner, would be welcome in God's family. Then, as now, the Bible doesn't always give us clear and straightforward answers to our deepest, most urgent spiritual questions. So the eunuch asks Philip for help, which is just as remarkable, if not more so, than the fact that Philip agrees to help him. Over the past few months, members of our congregation joined with members of Fairmount Presbyterian Church to engage in conversation about the sin of racism. One of the concepts raised in our readings and discussions was the concept of white privilege, the fact that our society has been constructed in such a way to afford certain privileges to people based solely on the color of their skin. The only way to effectively confront white privilege is for those of us who identify as white to actively work to recognize and give up some of the privileges we hold. And the only way to do this is to recognize that we can't even fully understand this privilege without help from our brothers and sisters of color. The Ethiopian may be marginalized because of his status as a foreigner and a eunuch, but compared to Philip, he is the one privileged by wealth and power and education, yet he sets them all aside to ask Philip for help. When Philip discovers that the eunuch is reading the prophet Isaiah, he must have immediately understood why the Holy Spirit wanted to bring the two of them together. Because Philip could teach the eunuch that this whole book of Isaiah promises that freedom and justice are for those labeled as outcasts. And Philip could explain that this particular passage the man is reading, which describes a messianic figure being led to the slaughter, this passage is about none other than Jesus, who came to show that God's love extends to all people. Despite his wealth and education and power, the eunuch wants nothing more than the assurance that he too is welcomed into God's family. And into that desperation, Philip speaks the good news. Through Jesus, God not only knows and understands humiliation and injustice and suffering, God has experienced it firsthand and overcome it with love. About whom is the prophet writing, himself or someone else, the eunuch asks Philip. But what he's really asking is what we all ask when we read God's word. Is this word for me? Is this good news just about God and all those other people God loves, or is it also good news for me? As the chariot speeds along, Philip tells the eunuch that this good news is indeed for him, foreigner, outsider, outcast that he is. Philip tells him about John the Baptist, baptizing anyone who came, washing them clean of their sin to prepare them for Christ's coming. Philip explains that Jesus himself was baptized by John and then went on to demonstrate the boundary-breaking love of God to love all people so well it got him killed. Philip tells the eunuch that even a violent and unjust execution was not enough to defeat God's love, 
and that God raised this Jesus from the grave. Philip tells the eunuch that Jesus sent the disciples to share the good news, that God's love is for everyone. Philip must have said all of this, because when the chariot passes a body of water, the eunuch demands that it stops and asks, what is to prevent me from being baptized? As I prepared for this worship service, this sermon, Korah's baptism, I kept thinking about this question. And it occurred to me that we maybe ought to ask this question every time we celebrate the sacrament of baptism. What is to prevent you from being baptized? Because the answer to this question reminds us that, yes, baptism is all about an individual and God's love for us as individual children of God, but it also reminds us that God's love can only be experienced in community, which is why we baptize in worship. We baptize Cora today not because there is nothing that would prevent her from being baptized. There are a few things, not the least of which is that she's so young she barely knows her own name, much less the name of God. But we baptize her by asking her parents and her family and her church family to take vows, to teach her, to help her, to guide her as she begins to learn the wonder and mystery of God revealed to us in Jesus Christ. When the eunuch asks this question, what is to prevent me from being baptized? He is challenging Philip. He is challenging the scripture. He's challenging God. And it must have given Philip pause. Because the easy answer to the question is, there's a lot to prevent him. He literally just heard about Jesus. He'd had no time to take a class on the sacraments or meet with the pastor. He was an Ethiopian, a foreigner. He lived far from the land of Israel and the location of the early church. He was also a servant to the queen, loyal to the wrong sovereign. And he was a eunuch, one whose God-given body had been altered so that he could not live a so-called normal life. What was to prevent him from being baptized? All kinds of things. But the Holy Spirit that brought Philip to this wilderness place was not about to desert him now. And when the eunuch asks the question and Philip struggles for an answer, the Spirit whispers in Philip's ear an answer that surely surprised Philip as much as the eunuch. What is to prevent him? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. In the years following World War II, Murat Yangan spent time in a remote corner of eastern Turkey. He became friends with an elderly couple there. Life had been good to the couple, but their one sadness was that they missed their only son, who had left years before to go work in Istanbul. One day, Murat visited the couple and found them bursting with pride, eager to show him the new cupboard their son had sent them. It was indeed a beautiful piece of furniture, and the woman had already arranged her best tea set on its upper shelf. Murat was polite, but curious. Why would their son go through such expense to send them a tea cupboard? And if the purpose of the furniture was storage, why did it have no drawers? Are you sure it's a tea cupboard? He asked them. Yes, they were sure. But the question continued to nag him. So just before he left, he said, do you mind if I take a closer look? With their permission, he turned the cupboard around and unscrewed a couple of packing boards. A set of cabinet doors swung open to reveal a fully operative ham radio set. The tea cupboard was intended to connect the couple to their son, to let them communicate with him. But unaware of its real contents, they were simply using it to display their china. There is not one of us who can walk this journey of faith alone, who alone can figure out what it means to be a faithful disciple. Alone, we are all too likely to take the gifts of God, the Bible, the church, the sacraments, the Holy Spirit, and turn them into beautiful pieces of furniture that gather dust in the corner. 
Without Philip, the eunuch could not understand the scriptures. Without the eunuch, Philip could not understand the full reach of God's love. We cannot navigate this journey of faith alone. No matter who we are and what we think we know, we need each other. We need infants and toddlers and adolescents. We need millennials and Gen Xers and boomers. We need scholars and novices. We need longtime members who know our history and first-time visitors who see our unrealized potential. We need pastors and lay leaders. And we need to guide and encourage one another because we all have things that prevent us from feeling welcome and fully at home in God's embrace, which is why the task of being the church requires constantly opening ourselves up to the Holy Spirit and to one another. We need each other. We need to worship together and pray together. We need to discern together and plan together. We need to question together and wonder together. We need to rejoice together and mourn together. We need to serve together and eat together. And most of all, we need together to open this book that is for us the sacred scrapbook of our faith, God's way of communicating with us. So that when any one of us dares to voice the question, what is to prevent me from answering God's call? We will all be ready and able to hear the Holy Spirit whispering in our ear and respond with conviction, what is to prevent you? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Amen. <laughs>